Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Mona TV and TV5. And you are watching Insight with Praveen Puram. As we are seeing number of uh, shows, getting a lot of knowledge on different aspects. And uh, today we have, we have our guest as Ms. Bhairavi Chandramauli. So she is a Montessori a lead teacher. And she also teaches in our Montessori in in coming Atlanta, Atlanta. Today's world, because of the pandemic, there is a virtual challenges, right? How do we learn virtually? So we are going to learn more about the challenges from Ms. Bhairavi. Welcome, Ms. Bhairavi. Thank you so much for having me, Mr. Puram. Thank you. So just let's uh, introduce Ms. Bhairavi. So Ms. Bhairavi Chandramauli began her journey in education with a bachelor's degree in psychology from San Jose State University, California, followed by homeschooling her first child. Having witnessed the Montessori methodology in action with her second child's formative year of learning, she decided to continue teaching with the MACTE approved credential in Montessori elementary education. She has been part of Montessori Academy at Sharon Springs since 2016. The immense potential of the human brain and sensitive periods of development are two critical elements that draws her closer to Maria Montessori, unparalleled pedagogy. Along with the passion for caring for nature, she enjoys igniting the spark in young minds and being surrounded with love. Welcome again. Thank you so much for your time, uh, Ms. Bhairavi. So anything you wanted to add apart from what I have uh, explained about yourself? No, you said it well. Thank you so much for having me. It's a joy. It's a joy to be on this show and uh, to spread whatever I have with everybody and share with everybody. Thank you again. Getting on to the, uh, the details of the show. As you know, during this pandemic, it is very, very unusual and learning virtual has become a new norm. So what do you see? What are the challenges you see in your day-to-day -day life and also with the students, you interact with the students. Of course, we all switched to virtual in March and uh, it was unprecedented. We were not prepared. So we all had to learn as we went about, but then we all expected this to be over by summer and all of us to get back to normal, but it didn't happen. And uh, we were faced with a challenge to actually launch a formal virtual program. So for us, uh, having a Montessori philosophy in as our forefront and uh, transferring that into virtual was um, challenging because Montessori is very hands-on. We didn't want to lose that um, the principles behind Montessori while going virtual. We didn't want to become like any traditional virtual setting. We wanted to hold on to the essence of Montessori. So uh, it was tricky but we kind of held on to few basic elements which we think are very integral to Montessori and we stuck to it and we have been kind of playing around like the engagement the students engagement is so important and in a virtual setting it kind of gets tricky because the child is somewhere else like now we have some students from across the continent they traveled and wow. they are across the continent yes so how do you engage them? I think that is the biggest challenge. When the child is at home, like they're pretty much locked up at home and their, their access to the actual world is limited, cut off. How do you engage them? How do you keep the spark alive till we can have them back in our classroom? So that is the biggest challenge, but we look at it more as a way of keeping the spark alive, you know? They're home, we need to just keep them going, keep them going. So that's right. the biggest thing. Let's come to the safety, right? So today we have virtual in classes. Do you think it's really confusing or overloaded to the teachers today? What, what is your feeling having both of them are? I feel if you have only one, that would be perfect, but few people are coming on online, few people are coming in person. Don't you think it's a tedious job to the teachers? Yes, in a traditional setting, yes, that's what is happening. The teacher is providing students in-person lessons while she's providing 
you know, virtual lessons. I think it's exhausting, but uh, hats off to the teachers. I think they are doing exactly what I'm doing, keeping the spark alive, keeping it going. And, you know, they are the hope and future. So I think we are just doing our best, but hats off to all those teachers. It is a challenge. It is exhausting. It's challenging with the mask on, with um, all those restrictions, but they make it happen. So that's really great of the teachers, you know, a lot of patience. Yeah. It takes patience. <laughs> yeah, it takes patience. And it's, it, it, you know, not, people choose this profession over many other because it's a noble profession and they are sticking with it in this crisis. And I think that is commendable. Coming to the uh, Montessori, right? So people, this is a private school and uh, even my kid goes to the Montessori. So when you are talking about virtual, all Montessori is you feel and learn, right? With the material. But being in virtual, how are you able to really manage the concept of Montessori? So uh, we have been uh, creative to a large extent. So what we did in our school is we actually created Montessori kits for them, very basic kits based on their level. So they all received a kit so they could take it home and they could work with them. So the younger kids received like mobile alphabets. They received, as I said, the checkerboard that your daughter is enjoying. So yeah. they're learning how to do multiplication. So, and we created bead sets for them. Actually, one of our teachers, she sat and put together those bead bars for them. So it was a, it was a lot of, uh, um, it was fun. It was fun putting it together. We had to be creative. And of course we can't provide the whole array of materials that a classroom provides. But what we have tried is a lot of hands-on where the students are actually doing things on the other end. So in my um, upper elementary classroom where I have like a fifth grader learning the sum of the internal angles of a triangle, in a classroom they have materials that they can manipulate but I just had to improvise. So what they do is they take a graph paper. I take a graph paper. We cut up all the three types of triangles and we cut them up to see how the internal, angle, internal angles come together to make a straight angle. So they're probably doing one step more than they would do in a classroom because in a classroom, it's a ready-made material that they just manipulate. But here they're actually creating the material, which is a very important aspect of development where you actually create before you manipulate. So we added that one extra step to the learning where you create before you manipulate. So we didn't expect, but we went along with it and it evolved and it's, it's been a joy. And they, they're so thrilled when they see, oh my God, that is so true. So that's awesome. where the pleasure. I really agree with you. Um, in a sense that they are very thoughtful, creative, learning from you online. And it's an individual capability improvement. At the same time, I also want to know the engaging learning environment as well in this example. For example, when you are teaching, out of the 10 or 15 students for whom you teach, but they, one or two might be he might be not able to catch up. Mm -hmm. so how do you engage such students in this limited time? So I guess that's where our training comes in place. Our training emphasizes not on mastering the material, but the social emotional development of the students. So we devote a lot of time to know who the students are. So for me, um, it was a new platform where I have been, like some students I had met in the past, so it was easy, but some I'm yet to meet in person. But, you know, you, you make the eye contact, you're looking at their social uh, or facial cues. And mm -hmm. those, the, the, you, you know, with time and experience as a parent, as a teacher, you know who is getting it and who is not. So we do use, you know, the chat box and I send a private message when a student is not willing to or is hesitating to tell in front of everyone that I don't get it. So we chat with them and, you know, they chat back and sometimes they're sending me private messages saying, Miss Bairavi, I don't get it. 
can you teach me again? So I make time for them afterwards. That's when we do those one-on-one -on -one sessions. We do office time because not every student is open to, you know, confess or to reveal that they didn't master the content. But I think the experience, instincts, all play in role. And, you know, when you look at them on the screen, you know who's getting it and who is not. And without embarrassing them, that's very important. Without embarrassing them, you need to kind of make a note and also um, create the channel for communication. Wow. That the student can reach me at any point with any question. So the channel of communication, you need to build and that comes with trust. You know, they need to trust you as a person, not just as a teacher. So that human connection. So you devote a lot of your energy in opening up the channel so the child will reach out to you. You know, and I think you explained very well, Miss Bhairavi. I agree with you because now when the chat option, most of the kids might not know. It's a good way of educating them to give it privately and you taking time and, you know, educating them and bringing them up to the speed. But don't you think in these grounds, the kids get used to chatting with each other when you are teaching? So how do you cope up with that? As a parent, I get uh, worried because whenever <laughs> I am in between my meeting, I just keep an eye on my kid mm -hmm. to see what she is doing. But how do you make them understand and balance in those aspects? See, that, that's where the, the discipline and the concept of self-discipline that is a very integral of the Montessori philosophy comes in play where we remind the students. I've had students tell me, Miss Bhairavi, can you disable the chat because somebody is talking? And I, I keep repeatedly telling them, I'm not gonna disable. I am gonna ask you to practice self-control. So, you know, something that we would practice in the classroom, self-discipline, self-control, self-management, I'm trying to instill that in their virtual setting. And actually the student who is kind of, you know, impulsive is, is getting the message and they do stop after one or two or three attempts. So, you know, that's when I'm trying to build my trust and communicate with that one student who wants to deviate from the norm. So oh, that's great to hear. Now let's come a little bit about, let's talk about building a sense of community, right? So if they are, the kids are in the school, they really enjoy with their peers, they play around, but being virtual, it's all new to them. So how, how do you really meet the need in that area? Do you give some time to chat together with the people or with the kids or how is it happening today? So uh, we do multiple things. One is uh, on Fridays, they have a club hour. Mm -hmm. So my students, they come to my Zoom room and mm -hmm. we have a club for doing uh, online coding. Mm -hmm. We have a club for doing a uh, girls meet up to do a sewing you know, club. They have a sewing club. So they bring their dolls and their clothes and they are just stitching clothes. And uh, so what I do is I make breakout rooms and the kids can pick which club they want to go to. And mm -hmm. they go into those club rooms and they share the screen. So we have one student who is teaching everybody to learn how to code. Wow. So he shares his screen and he's guiding everybody. So these kids are, so it, it is, it is, um, that is the time when I am not there, you know, uh, but I am supervising, but I am not present. So that's their time to mingle and be themselves and connect with each other. And what else we do is we also sometimes do like comprehension where I put them in breakout rooms and wow. say, you know, you decide who's going to be your team leader, like a spokesperson, and you all answer the questions together and we will meet back. You know, we meet again in the main room where you as a spokesperson for your team discusses what you decided. So we do multiple things like that mm -hmm. to engage them where I am not physically present but I am supervising them because they do need that time where they are engaging with each other without me being, you know, watching them. So we do that. And at the end of the day, we do play some games like scratch, like of mm -hmm. course they're all online, but again, I step back 
and they play those games. So that's their platform for communication and building that sense of community. Yeah, so, awesome. So Ms. Bhairavi, uh, don't you think now the kids miss racist time? Because always my kids talk about racist. They are very excited for the racist time, right? So how do you manage the racist time in the uh, school you have? Generally, they play for one hour or 30 minutes for exercise or playing anything outside outside games. Mm -hmm. So today, do you have that discipline in them to do that? To step out and have recess time? Exactly. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest challenge. And I, I, I we haven't really uh, been able to break through that. Mm -hmm. Because some students, so my vision was to like be out one day and everybody gets out and we do something. But we do have still have some students whose parents are working. Yes. So they are working and they're on call. So these students do not have the mobility to step out of the house. That is the biggest challenge. The right. children are actually homebound because they have working parents and they want their kids to be safe so their kids are home, but they're not able to step out. So I always try to create time during the day when I say, you need to get away from the screen. Just go get some sunlight, get some you know, outside time. It's good for you. So educating them, you know, constant education that why do you need vitamin D? Why do you need to move around? Why your eyes need rest from the screen? So that kind of education is something we are able to provide. But I am worried for these children, including my own children who are home. I think their activity level has come down. So yeah. it is a challenge. Definitely, definitely a challenge. Even I'm worried because this challenge is not only to the kids, it has to the parents too, because now their working hours have been, you know, staggered and extending hours yeah. where you cannot say no to anyone. But now I'm just thinking how to mark up, make up our time for the kids during. So some way we need to align, some way we need to align and the, the companies have to understand and, you know, the parents have to understand how maybe hopefully something evolves around that area and you know the kids get better in that area so especially on the the other thing i'm really worried in the screen time people are excited the kids are excited with their whatever the tabs or laptops and they are you know they are really going in deep and you know they are trying if you see my kid my kid is really getting interested in the powerpoint presentation mm -hmm. even though she doesn't have i know she has reached out to you many times that i'm going to do so now i'm worried in one way, I'm very happy that she's learning. In the other way, her screen time is increasing. So what do you, what do you want us to do psychologically to balance these situations? I think even as educators, you know, from mm -hmm. the educator's perspective, sometimes we probably need to just tell them this presentation involves you actually creating hands-on. Like actually you create a material and then show it to us then creating a PowerPoint. So that forces a child to get away from the screen and sit and draw. So give some, you know, hand-eye coordination, work on that and, you know, improve your motor skills, fine motor skills. So that is something we can do as educators. I think as parents too, as you said, it, it is a difficult time. So as long as I think I have a lot of parents who reach out to me and my own friends, it, it is an exhausting uh, experience for most people, because they're, as you said, work has become tedious. You're watching your children, you are, you know, you're not going out as much. So everything is homebound. Homebound. I think yes. as long as we can all try to create whatever balance we can, and this will be over soon and we will be back to normal. Back to normal. So, okay. you know, just, you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel and um, there's only so much some people are able to do. Wow. And you need to step back and just just shut down everything and sit back and relax and tell yourself it's going to be OK. I guess that's probably the best approach because a lot of things are not in our control now. Yes, you, you have rightly said, uh, Ms. Bhairavi, everyone are praying for that as soon as we get the vaccine and we are back to normal. Hopefully that will happen very soon. And um, let's talk about a little bit about the responsibility of the work, right? So how the responsibility of the work is taken by the teachers and the kids, how do you track them? 
Uh, we use Google Classroom as a platform mm -hmm. for communication. So the students and Google has done a good job in how they have formulated the Google Classroom. So it, it is very straightforward when you say, OK, this is the assignment. These are the guidelines and this is when it is due. And if it's an extended project, we kind of break it down for them. Uh, and the students, again, being Montessori kids, we do not say we, we, they don't get graded. They mm -hmm. don't get penalized for turning in work late because, you know, there are un, you know, circumstances where children need more time than prescribed. So they're Montessori kids. They know. And they also are. So basically working on making them responsible. So reminders that, mm -hmm. hey, my friend. So on Fridays or Thursday afternoons, we touch base. Hey, these are the things missing. And being Google Classroom, they can actually see what they're missing and what are the due dates. And that helps them to prioritize. Suppose they have four things missing for the week or due for tomorrow, then we help them prioritize. Okay, of the four, these two are probably more important. Maybe the other two you can work during the weekend. It's okay. Or if you need help, then we can work it together. Sometimes we meet them during office hours and say, hey, do you want to just do this with us? Because, you know, it, it is hard to be doing a lot of those things asynchronous, like on your own. Mm -hmm. So we call them, say, hey, just join me during my office hours and you can work on it while I do my own stuff. So that is encouraging, you know, so then they know that, oh, I can have some company with my teacher or a yeah. co-student. So being Montessori, we keep reminding them. And we have been fortunate that our students have not slacked off just for the sake of it, it there's always been a good reason why it has happened. So we are fortunate in that way. <laughs> we have good kids, good families. That's rightly said. I agree with you, Ms. Bhairavi, but um, do you think that out of this, I can tell two things might be a tedious thing. One, don't you think if you are not tracking the work strictly, do you think the laziness will increase and the irresponsibility will increase in the child? Oh, yeah. Sometimes if the kids can sense that, oh, I can fly under the radar, <laughs> then they continue flying under the radar. So it has happened. You know, sometimes we, I have caught people after two weeks. Uh -huh. Hey, you're missing this and this and this. But I think as a teacher, our responsibility is to constantly ensure Sure. work is getting completed. Sometimes it is not just the completion of work, but the mastery of the work. You know, so we need to track if the child is mastering, you know, even if they have not completed, if they have mastered, some students don't want to complete once they think they have mastered it. So that's very demotivating them. Like it's not motivating enough for them to ma finish up work when they think, oh, I mastered. So you make accommodations as and when needed based on the student and their needs. Awesome. So, so, Ms. Bhairavi, uh, I wanted to touch upon two, three things, and then we will close the session. You, in, your, in our conversation, you said globally. Now, any, the kids can do globally. Can you tell some examples if some of the kids of your students are abroad? How are you managing their time? Um, so, we do have a student who, has, who is currently in India mm -hmm. for family reasons. So, one of our teachers, my co-workers, she meets the student a little earlier in the day. So before our usual time starts, she's meeting the student, you know, before time because, because of the time difference. So we do have another student um, who is at least eight hours ahead of us. Mm -hmm. So they have adjusted, we have adjusted. We have some students who are traveling to California next week for, you know, the holidays. So we do adjust a little bit, not a whole lot, but uh, the parents are accommodating and we are also adjusting. So, you know, coming to a middle point where it is reasonable for a student to be awake till late in the night or to wake up early in the morning. So uh, it has been challenging, but it has, uh, it has worked out so okay. far. It has worked out so far. Hats off, hats off, uh, Ms. Bhairavi, and not only you, to all the teachers who are Absolutely. doing. I could see the patience level when you think about them, today they are doing one-to-one -one with the kids, which is not required if it is face-to-face, uh, -face, right, you know. 
you are sitting on in front of zoom meetings every day in day out tracking things you know looking after the kids answering parents questions sometimes don't you feel te- it's a tedious job we chose this over other <laughs> for a good reason so definitely we didn't all sign up to teach virtually you know that was not our but then you adapt and you have to be flexible that's i think a biggest uh, um point or the 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 most important thing a teacher should have is flexibility no day no two days are the same for us you know okay. every day is different so if you're not flexible and if you're not ready to kind of go along with the flow it is hard to be a teacher so it, you have to take it in your stride to be flexible and uh, you know the uh, at the end of the day you walk out uh, with the satisfaction of bringing the spark you know the aha moments in learning mm-hmm. when the student goes oh my god i got it oh i can teach this person i know exactly how to do it those are the moments that keep you going that bring you brings you back to the classroom so it's the students awesome. at the end of the day it's nobody but the students who bring you back to keep doing it okay i would like to because you have done psychology degree i would like to ask you a couple of questions out of virtual but i just wanted to really hear from you a uh, private and a public school right so if you were to observe the psychology of the kid not only from the behavioral or the educational perspective or the screen time right these are the three aspects i want you to ask this question what is your feeling if you really take sampling of a public school and a private school the behavioral the educational the learning mechanism what 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 do you think three to five differences uh i think this is a, a, i don't want to generalize because mm-hmm. each private school is different okay each public school is different and the demographics of public schools and the private schools you know so there are just so many elements and components that i i don't think it's uh it's easy or it is right to generalize mm-hmm. but um i would say like a smaller school whether it's private or public mm-hmm. you know a smaller class size where the teachers are taken care by their administrations and you know they get the support from the t- parents they're definitely able to nurture mm-hmm. the students better so it is always a smaller environment which is ideal for learning you know but it's it's a tough it's i don't think it's fair to generalize a public school with private school because some private schools are humongous and you are, your child can get lost in that setting so it really depends on where and parenting a huge part of a child's development is the the parenting that takes place in the house so we are and as an educator you do your share but the parents are the major chunk so it all at the end of the day comes down to the work put in by the parents oh my god you rightly said this reminds me <laughs> whenever we go in the community uh, you know chit chats with the parents they always have a gossips right what's going on in the virtual you know everything it's like a task to the parents and the parents have to sit with uh, the children to do that is one gossip and also people i could see i i i also do not want to generalize but i hear from people from the public school especially they say oh my god they are giving lot of work lot of work they are not even reviewing so yes even private school my kid as well she has lot of work but i see lot in the public school that's why i was i was asking what is the difference here do i need to understand that public school is giving more work and more knowledgeable to the kids or i should understand public private schools are not giving much work so i was just little confused so i just that's the reason i'm asking you this question yeah yeah yeah, yeah. no the question is valid my my children are in public school setting right now but they're older you know one is high school one is college um the way to look at this is is the quality of instruction it doesn't have to be the quantity so as long as you know the teachers focus on the quality of the instruction rather than you know being too busy with the quantity we are going to be successful as teachers and and wanting the kid to come back the next day you know so a, a, a lot needs to be 
it, it falls on us as educators to just step back. There are times when I have to step back and see, uh, okay, how did last week go? Was I successful? Was it overwhelming? And feedback from the students. I think a lot of those schools where there is frustration from the parents is because the chief teachers are not getting it for feedback from the parents or the students. Now, there are many reasons why in public schools that's not possible. So I'm, I wouldn't be able to go there. That's not fair. But just, just sense what your students are feeling. Like if you don't get the feedback, it doesn't have to be verbal, but just when they walk into the Zoom room and you know, oh no, they, these are checked out people. People are checked out. We need to kind of make a change. So the teachers have to make the change so the kids are getting some quality. It is not the quantity, especially when the kids are home. I think it's the connection. It's the quality of the education. It doesn't have to be how many worksheets you did. I agree with you. You rightly said that quality is very important. So Ms. Bhairavi, I would like to really ask a couple of questions. Um, let's say your toughest top three challenges as a teacher and uh, top three challenges, what the kids might bring it to you, right? Something they might not be interested in this virtual or they might, they might tell some concerns. Can you share some of them with all the viewers so that you know the parents who are watching will get a sense of it? So challenges I face and challenges my students face. Okay. Is that, that's your question, right? Yes. Uh, I would say my challenge is um, firstly, putting too much pressure on myself mm -hmm. to, to do the best, to deliver the best. And um, that's the biggest challenge when you always think I could do more, I could do better, which is a good thing because then you're gonna try harder. And time, having enough time to prepare and to be, you know, to recharge and come back. That's a challenge pretty much for all educators. And um, in terms of students, I think uh, the biggest challenge is for the parents. And I feel we teachers have to be empathetic towards the parents right now. So when you have those parents reaching out, being frustrated or struggling, uh, more than being uh, defensive, we need to be assertive and reach out and listen to them because all they want is somebody, especially the teacher to listen to their concern. So, you know, uh, more than students, it's the parents, they're going through a lot. This is a difficult time for them. So we as educators need to be empathetic. We need to listen and give time to the parents because they are the one holding the fort at home. <laughs> I, I, can, I can do whatever I want, but if they are not at peace, they're not gonna be able to support the students. So it's a partnership. So it's important that, so that's the biggest challenge for the parents is, is the stress level is intense. Yeah. I also have a message for the parents that it's not the end of the world. So, you know, take a pause, it'll be over and our kids will bounce back. They will catch up on everything that they missed. But, you know, their, their mental well-being, parents' mental well-being and the students' mental well-being is most important at this point. So it's not, I think it's not worth stressing over uh, mastering concepts. Exactly. So, you know, I would, yeah, that's, I think that's the biggest challenge. I think for the students, the challenge is not being there with their peers. Peers, yes. The, that is the biggest challenge. And sometimes I see that uh, they don't leave the Zoom meeting after the meeting is over. They just hang around. <laughs> want to leave. And I know because they just want to be around people. So I teach music, like Indian classical music in my spare time. And some of my students, and they all go to traditional schools and they just don't leave the meeting after the music lesson is over. And I know they just want to chat they're missing on that social aspect. So we sit and chat. I think you covered what was in my mind, especially on the parents, because a lot, lot of parents are frustrated at their work and they might write a lot of emails to the teachers with the same tone what they think sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And and how you read. And uh, you rightly said you need to be empathetic. And, you know, like, pick up the phone and talk to the parents. Talk to the parents. Yeah, it's, I think rather than writing emails, talking would help because I know that you all are busy too, you know. Yeah, yeah, but you know, 
sometimes you know say hey can i quickly talk to you so i do that i i prefer to just call and say can we talk for two minutes and it really eases it eases the you know it, it eases the communication and you, you all come back to the same ground exactly so. miss bairavi not only you all the parents who are in it or any other way they have to talk and make the situation ease otherwise your emails are going to be read in which mood we never know <laughs> so we always need to be careful yeah no but it's hard you know written communication is always harder to interpret so you know yeah i think um, pretty much you have answered everything and um, um, i think one other thing i wanted to definitely talk with you on the examples right for example if you see the multiplication the way i learned is totally different i used to memorize the multiplications but when my kid is doing the the checkerboard aspect wow that was really awesome i really enjoyed and i wanted to do video on that believe yes, me or not that really yes. caught my attention so mm -hmm. can you tell me some of the, those things what is the difference of the montessori that's signature type of uh, learning so like when you said check a board uh when you are using such hands on material the children actually get a good sense of the place value you know what it is to be in the unit space value what it is what does it feel to be in the 10 space value oh you have those 10 bead bars oh so you know if i'm holding two of the 10 bead bars it's 20 so that sensorial experience that you know kinetic connection that you make with your place values with your numbers starts and then you transition to visualize all that in your head that that's the i think that's the most beautiful part about montessori education is is the connection with the material so when you say 2346 the child is visualizing oh this is the place value and you know the unit's place value is 10 times less than the tens place value and the hundreds place value is 10 times more than the tens place value and they they experience with those boards with those materials and manipulating with the beads and the material that these concepts become more concrete for them thank you that is very well said and i could see the difference how the kids learn with this uh, feeling the material and uh, miss bairavi we are at the end of the session i would love you to tell few precautions to the uh, viewers as a parents what precautions they should take during this virtual uh, time i i would say the first thing is monitor your kids on the screen because intentionally or unintentionally there is a lot of content online exactly which the students cannot process so it's important you know if you can set up security features or you monitor your kids movement a lot of times it's unintentional they don't know they are googling like everything is googling now every word they come across they don't know they want to google it and those words can lead to you know some interesting unnecessary sites so i think supervising monitoring your kids and knowing what they're doing on screen is important and getting them away from the screen helping them you know make them do chores make them rake the grass outside uh, make rake the leaves outside do something so i think we as parents have to get ourselves out away from the screen so we can get our kids away so reducing screen time and monitoring their screen time i think that those are the biggest challenges and we have to be on top of it wow definitely as you said uh, you know all the parents are already watching and i'm sure that uh, they will follow this rule and uh, keep their kids safe oh yes and um, thank you so much for your uh, 30 minutes time uh, during this weekend and uh, definitely this uh, all the 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 themes what you have said are the precautions what you have made definitely help the parents and uh, if you have anything more we will do in more sessions in the coming sessions miss bairavi again thank you have a great weekend thank you viewers for your time and then keep watching insight with uh, uh, praveen puram and uh, for more good shows and uh, knowledgeable shows for you and it is available on mana tv as well thank you all have a great weekend bye miss bairavi